And welcome to the Confound Millennial, starring Stephen Sturvin Michaels and featuring the cast of Headwaters and interviews from a goodly portion of beautiful Northeast Georgia. And now for our first special guest, Jill Crunkleton. Woohoo! What's up? Hey, long time no it, see. <laughs> yeah, long time no see. It has been what 2013? Yeah, that sounds about right. So what's that? Eight years? I'm bad at math. Yeah, yeah, almost a decade. Almost a decade. Wow, it really doesn't feel like it's been that long. Well, except for the COVID year part, which is about 10 extra years in there. So, you know. Yeah, make it about 20. <laughs> mm. but, uh, so, how have you been doing? Well, um, pretty well. This year was pretty rocky. Um, COVID aside, I had a lot of other stuff happen. Um, uh, my dad, my dad got sick and died last summer. And so I was taking care of him during COVID and I thanked him. I said, that's probably keeping me from getting sick or arrested. Um, not that, you know, that I thanked him for dying, but that we had a really good, it was a, it was a good end if you can have a good end. And then I went back and I, I don't know if you remember this about me. I used to, I worked, um, for a hospice as a grief counselor. And then, so I came back from that into doing grief counseling during COVID and that, um, that about broke me. And by about March, once our numbers kind of started going down, I was just tired and I have been doing helping work for about 20 years now. And so, um, I decided that it was time to take a break. I think a lot of people this past year have kind of been reevaluating, um, their priorities and their life. And I think everybody had this big fat come to Jesus during COVID. And so I am on a six month sabbatical, um, which is really lovely. And so I'm so glad to get to do headwaters uh, during this time because I have time and energy to devote to it. <laughs> so, um, but overall I am good. Um, it's been a hard year, but there's been so many bright spots and so much help. So I'm not sitting around feeling broken at all. I just feel really grateful and really grateful for a chance to rest. I feel much better than I did a few months ago. I absolutely feel you there. I actually last year ended up homeless for a little bit. And oh, wow. Uh, oh, Steven. Now, you know, I've, I've had some family come together and give me some time to focus on me, focus on getting better, get, my podcast together and stuff like that. And yeah, I totally feel what you're saying. It, uh, last year was definitely a rough year, but I feel like everybody, everybody kind of came together and, uh, we've all helped each other come out better on top. Yeah. Sometimes the like, darkest nights make for the brightest stars is what I just keep saying to myself. So, so the reason you were here is, uh, of course, Headwaters is coming back. Yes, indeed. For the first time in almost a decade, as we just said. Mm -hmm. And Headwaters, to all of us, means something important. But I want to know, why is Headwaters so important to you? Oh, that's super easy. Um, headwaters, really, and this is going to sound like, I don't know, more dramatic uh, or like I'm making something up, but like it really totally changed the course of my life. Um, I had moved to this area just about a year prior um, and had started going to the little church across the street from the Satina Coochie Community Center where Headwaters was performed. And on a whim, um, I went to the talent inventory. I was expecting an audition. It wasn't. <laughs> and then I, you know, and they're like, all right, great, come on. And that doing headwaters allowed me to put down roots in this community in a way that I never had before. Um, I got to meet it, it, the, the, it was so magical because it was this intergenerational show. So I got to meet all these kids and then I got to meet all these 
older people. And so I had people to teach and people to learn from. And, and I just, it really, I formed strong relationships with so many people. And I was like, okay, this is it. This is, this is where I want to be. And so it really just, it changed, like, instead of me, like moving on in a couple of years, I have been here ever since. You know, I say this a lot during the course of the next couple of interviews in this episode, but Headwaters is really, it's a family. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's, uh, you know, it's the first, uh, second family I ever had. And, uh, I just remember, you know, I was probably annoying the most annoying little kid ever when I first started, um, Oh, I know Lisa probably hated me back in the oh, day. No. There were kids way more annoying than you, Stephen. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like uh, without Headwaters, there's so many things that I wouldn't. I mean, like, it just changed my life so much. Like, uh, you know, I was raised very sheltered. And there's just a lot of different things that I uh, wouldn't have accepted if I didn't have this second family. You wow. Know? I didn't know that about you. You just always oh, seemed yeah. like a cool hippie kid. And I had no idea. Oh, I was super rebellious. <laughs> so Headwaters was like the perfect place for you to come to live out a little rebellion in a safe, well-supervised environment. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. I don't know. That, that's the, the beautiful thing about headwaters to me, like from the get go, from the, as soon as I started really getting into it, I'm a, I'm a social worker. That's my, my, my work. And I watched this, how it worked from like the bottom up and the top down. So it's like you come into a community, you get people to tell their stories, then you get people to act out those stories. And so you like learn about the community. It provides this, wonderful social connection between the community. You bring other people outside the community in to watch this. I don't know. It was just, it, it just built in so many ways. I just thought it was such a brilliant concept. Um, so anyway, it's, sorry, I'm rambling now. So <laughs> you're good. And it's such an inception type thing. It, you know, it's, it started out as a way to tell stories about the community and then it became deeply a part of the community. Yes. Yes. Well, and it, you know, the thing is, is when you learn about like, you know, there was a whole, the whole song about like come here's and been here's, I was very clearly a come here, but by learning about the history and like integrating with, <laughs> I mean, it was a way that we actually integrated been here's and come here's and then we were just us. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's powerful. That that's what I've said. Someone asked me once, um, you know, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you like to live? And I said, I think I live there. Because this community is so, I, th I feel like so many people are missing out on community. You know, we're, we're in this internet age and like you and I, we, we're watching, talking via video chat and I feel like I'm on Star Trek, but we're in some ways we're more connected yet less connected than ever. But like real face-to-face -face community. I mean, when my dad got sick and, and Sarah had to come down and, and my dad lived far from here we need someone to take care of our cats. And immediately we had a posse of people who were like cobbling together cat care. Like that's community. Like when we find out that someone's sick, we show up, if someone dies, we show up like, and I, that's I, I, that kind of connection is, I feel like is growing increasingly rare. And I, I really think headwaters really helped to cement that um, and reinforce that here. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, through this podcast, like, I know what you're talking about because I talk to people every day, all day through this, but I don't know any of the people I talk to. Mm -hmm. Well, there's and something about face to face, like being together and then doing something really vulnerable, like singing and dancing on a stage together. That creates a whole different kind of bond. And it's, I'm kind of jealous. Of, well, I'm really jealous of you guys because uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you, I've moved to Kentucky. Oh, wow. So, no, I didn't know really. I can't were. be a part of the show this year, but, Not, um, but yet you are. <laughs> yes. In a way, but you guys have, uh, you know, come out of this year of 
we haven't really seen many people, you know, over the course of COVID. And then you get to go and rejoin this uh, second family for a show. And, uh, you know, it's been hard to meet people up here. Mm. Uh, it's very much more shut down than Georgia ever was. Oh, wow. And so I, I envy you guys being able to uh, come out of this and then see like all these amazing people that mean so much to you. Yeah. And I'm so glad that I've gotten to talk to you guys during mm -hmm. the course of this podcast. Right on. Yeah. When we, uh, we had a little preliminary meeting on Thursday and so, you know, it's like, one, I could hug everybody. Everybody's vaccinated. Yay. Hugs, hugs, hugs. And then we're sitting there and Lisa's talking. And I don't know if you remember this, but the, the sound of the air conditioning coming on in the gym, because the vent is that cloth tube. And so you hear this <laughs> as it inflates. And we were all like, oh, we're home. This is so great. <laughs> it was like, but I was, yeah, I was like, this is a really nice way to come out of COVID year. Uh, the, the COVID summer before was so starkly different. Uh, I, I mean, I was extra isolated trying to keep my dad safe. Um, you know, so yeah, this is, oh, it's like falling onto a warm cushion. But, you know, this just means you're going to have to like find some community theater or something in your area and get, get involved because it really is. It's a great way to meet people. Lisa had actually mentioned to me that, uh, and it's, Sadly, on the other side of Kentucky, but Harlan. Joe Biden had started a play up here in in Harlan. I think is what she was yeah. saying. Yes. Yeah. So, what part of what? Where? Where are you? What part of Kentucky are you in? I'm closer to West Virginia. Oh, okay. All right. Got it. So yeah. I looked it up yesterday, and it's like three hours away from me. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a lot. But sometimes there's other little, I mean, it's amazing. Like I got involved in some stuff over in Dahlonega too. So you just kind of have to look around, but it is like figuring out how to meet people um, and form real true connections, like to punch through the small talk. How's the weather? Blah, blah, blah. You know, to get to right. the, the, the heart of stuff where you form real re relationships with people. It, it does feel increasingly hard to do, especially like in our day and time, but also like the older I get, those kinds of conversations are harder to breach with people, if that makes sense. Right. And, you know, I hate to repeat myself because I'll say this again later in the episode to Lisa, but I almost wanted to start my own little uh, thing up here because the stories that you hear around here are vastly different than the stories you hear in Georgia. Of course. And by that, I mean, you hear a lot of like cryptids and alien stories around here. Interesting. <laughs> Bigfoot, well, a big thing, Mothman. Okay. There's a story about a uh, farm that was held up by a group of aliens. There's all sorts of weird stories up here. I mean, if you have the gumption and the, the uh, if you can find the, it's all about finding a core group of people. I, like I've just learned this in any kind of, any kind of community endeavor you want to do. You got to find a core group of people who are energized around it and who are like going to be the foot soldiers of it. But I mean, I'll tell you, story is so important to humans. If you think, if you really stop and think, like if I had to explain humans to like aliens, I would say, Yes, we are. Um, we put more energy into figuring out how to kill one another and tell stories than any other activity at all, you know, because stories are told like not just through plays and like books, but like music and poetry and pictures and art. So, yeah, killing people and telling stories, super important just to being human. So, yeah, you should totally you should start collecting stories and then see if you can find some people who want to get something like that off the ground. I already know a couple guys that wanted to make a couple uh, YouTube videos based off of some stuff. Well, I'll talk to them, see what happens from there. You know, go where the energy is. Anything uh, you want to say about the show before we go upcoming? Just excited. I'm like, I'm so ecstatic that I'm going to be spending a week in the gym again, singing with, because that was the other thing about COVID because suddenly singing was dangerous, right? Aerosol transmission and, deep lung air. And so like, 
oh, what joy. Oh, what joy. I'm just excited. I hope everyone will come. I hear the tickets are selling well. We're going to have kind of limited seating. Um, still trying to encourage people to be COVID safe with variants and stuff going around. It's still pretty scary. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just joyful. Well, I'm really glad for you. Thanks for coming on and uh, have a great day, Jill. Thank you, Stephen. You take care. And next on the show, my friend and yours. Well, if he ain't yours, he better be because he's one of the greatest men out there. I'd like to introduce to you Jerry Grillo. Hey, little brother bear. How you doing? Oh, bear. <laughs> we had some fun, didn't we? Oh, yeah. That was, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier on the show about uh, just how young i was when the first year of headwaters was and that was just uh wanting to be a bear was a dream of mine as a child <laughs> yeah you and you were a good bear when you hit when you had the chance was it it was 14 years ago man that was a long time ago that would be i would be 12 yeah good lord so that would make you 48 now wow yeah, that's like amazing that. <laughs> you were all yeah, but you know what? You you were always an old soul, I think. <laughs> Cuz you were hanging with the bears. <laughs> mm -hmm. I definitely, I don't know, you know, no offense to any of the other guys my age there, but I was always hanging out with the older group. I know? noticed that. That was always cool. Yeah, that was um and and again, yeah, you had some good young guys, but but I think you were um you were readily accepted into the even though I don't think we shared any of it, readily accepted into the moonshine swilling uh, crew. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to be the designated driver. <laughs> the 12 year old. And exactly. that's North Georgia for you. Yeah, that's it. North Georgia rules are a little bit different. Got enough phone books to sit on? You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jerry, tell me a little bit about headwaters from your point of view because throughout this episode we're going to see it through mine but through your point of view as an adult when it started and yeah, as a i was yeah i was already i was already fairly well formed although i'm not quite there yet either but uh yeah fairly well formed person in my 40s at the time and and um it was a whole new opportunity a whole new way of learning stuff, you know, for me, like it was an opportunity to try playwriting for the first time with a real playwright, Joe Carson. I can't say enough about Joe Carson. She was, you know, my friend and mentor and um, without her. And of course, without Lisa Mount, my dear friend, one of my dearest friends, I wouldn't have been involved. You know, it was just one of those things that, that happened that Lisa cooked up. I don't know if you've spoken with Lisa already, but, um, but that'll be fun. This was something that Lisa cooked up. I knew it was coming. I, I and um, you know, I'd heard of Joe Carson, and I didn't even know that Joe Carson was a female. You know, at first when I first heard, then who's this Joe Carson? You know, um, that's how unschooled I was in the world of, of this kind of this kind of theater, this kind of production, community story plays, right? Which is a little bit different from what we think of as community theater, where you're doing the odd couple at the dinner theater, that kind of thing. As you know. Right. This was all original stuff based on true stories with a lot of artistic license, uh, you know, used by the writers and the actors. <laughs> so I think I think it made it a lot of fun and it brought a sense of, yeah, definitely made brought a sense of community into the whole affair. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there was just. There's some special about Headwaters from the very beginning, from the moment. I, uh, yeah, I, in the I moment agree. that I first became involved in it, I knew that something special had already been happening behind the scenes as well. There was a sense of magic. There was, and there were those. There, were, that's right. But before, um, I remember before we started doing talent inventories. Do you remember that they weren't called auditions? They were called talent inventories. And I, I don't know if that was a a phrase that Lisa invented or or something that she learned in her years of theater you know, or her and Joe cooked up, but, um, 
But anyway, before the talent inventories, we were getting together to talk about this, you know, the scheme that we had coming up. And um, it was just, it felt really cool to sort of be included in the discussion, right? Because again, this was a whole new kind of project for me. I'd been a journalist all my life and I had volunteered summit at, uh, at the Sauti Nakuchi Center where we, you know, where we put on, where we produced Headwaters. Um, I had done some volunteering there and, and a little bit of theater there, that kind of thing. And, um, and I guess Headwaters was really the first opportunity to write like a full-fledged sort of play with, with Joe, right, as a co-playwright and, and string together um, a bunch of true stories, you know, and I, I don't know, some of them might have been yours, Stephen. I mean, there were a lot of stories. I don't know if you remember the story gathering um, events I that do. we had as well. Right. I, don't I mean, think I, I uh, nowadays I would have quite a few to add, but, you know, in my younger yeah. days, I didn't have quite many stories under my belt. You know, I think that's why this kind of art form might be a gift that keeps on giving. I think you're going to have to write some of this down, whether it's presented in a form of uh, some kind of, you know, live narrative or something that's on a page or, or on a screen somewhere. You need to write down those stories because that was that was kind of what made this uh, Headwaters special was there was this, I don't know, this magic sense of people willingness to share. You know, a lot of times people aren't willing to share a lot about themselves, right? And this was an opportunity them for, for them to tell stories that some of them were very personal. You know, some were very sort of ancillary. You know, my grandfather could do anything with duct tape. Boy, he could build anything. And so we took, had remember we had some fun uh, employing duct tape into some other true stories, you know, like the kids who went down, you might've been in this piece, the kids who went down the river, um, who des destroyed the raft. Um, they had a raft made out of duct tape and I don't know. That was, it was, I think that was a year that I wasn't in it. Okay. It was a, this catastrophic trip down the river, but anyway, we, we got to employ a lot of different elements for a lot from a lot of true stories to tell these stories about what it's like to live here or to grow up here or to just experience, you know, here. And uh, I, it made, yeah, it was cool. It was a cool time to really dive in. Yes. And I, I really remember from that first two years, you know, being 12 and 13 and saying, you know, every day during the summer, I had an old man shooting a gun at me. That's right. You weren't you the kid you having to work with Skip? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was me. Skip loved that gun too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You got to be introduced to to um, to that. You got you were introduced to um, dynamite fishing. I think you were mm -hmm. introduced to to a lot of um, spectacular influences. I believe that um, you know if you didn't try them in real life, you should have. You know, but. But yeah, I think that was, we probably could have had a little disclaimer at the beginning of each show. Now, don't really try this at home because a couple of people in the cast already have, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Look at the guy, the guy who's missing the finger in the first act, you know, that's the guy who tried dynamite fishing. But no, there, there was that really, that real cool sense of authenticity because you were playing alongside two of people who had done some of this stuff because some of the stories were shared by people who were in the cast. That's what made it really fun and like stories about learning how to make moonshine, you know, and, and um, all these little things that were a little bit different from, you know, your basic uh, <laughs> local storytelling uh, convention. <laughs> and uh, it's really funny to me, you know, the last year of the play, I was the ATF agent trying to shut down the moonshine still. That's and, right, uh, man. And then I developed a crazy drinking problem a couple of years after that. <laughs> no kidding, uh, Stephen. Well, you, this is the weird irony of, of all of that, yeah. right? I mean, it, there was a lot of weird, uh, weird realities that sort of intertwined with the fantasy, right, of Headwaters. Right. Like, um, like, for example, um, there was one, you remember the stories that you're referring to. I mean, they were moonshine stories. And might have been the year the, the 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 version before that there was a scene where a character comes on stage with a like a crate of mason jars and um filled with you know with water um but there was supposed to be moonshine 
Well, this this uh, actor had also taught himself how to make moonshine because he had gotten so inspired by some of the stories we were telling, the moonshine stories, that he taught himself and he was making it in his basement. Well, in this crate of like 24 mason jars of water, one of them was moonshine. And only he knew which one it was. And um, before each show, to, uh, to, to drum up a little bit of courage, some of the more old timers in the in the crew would gather by the crate, by the prop crate there. And our friend, who's the, the guy who only knew, he, he would send the jar around. And if people were watching uh, from the audience and they were really looked closely at this crate of jars, it was always one that was, you know, about half empty, you know, and all the others were filled with water. The one that was half empty was the one that we'd been sampling shortly before that act. Usually it happened you know, during intermission, sometimes just before the show to, to build up our courage, you know, but anyway, I don't advocate that. And, and it's, you know, but it's one of the inside stories of Headwaters, I guess, uh, one of the darker, seamier stories of Headwaters. I will say none of the kids were allowed to do that. I don't think any of you guys, in fact, I don't think you were in this. That was the, the second version of Headwaters, but, but yeah, we always kind of did that. We always kind of snuck off being some of the older guys and, um, a little headwaters trivia there, but you know, um, it it took a lot of courage though, because a lot of these people that were in it weren't actors. That's exactly right, you included, right? I mean, had you done any acting before this? Well, you see, the beautiful thing about headwaters is it made me decide that I wanted to be an actor or at least be in the entertainment industry in some way. So in a way, if it wasn't for headwaters, butterfly effect, domino effect, whatever, I would not have this podcast at the moment. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a fascinating. You're, that's a good point, Steve. And I think that that's one of the things Headwaters did as this sort of community galvanizing event. One of the things that, that included, one of the offshoots of that was whatever inspiration value it had for people to um, to pursue, you know, whether to pursue different things that they were interested in. And I think especially for young people, there was that opportunity to, um, you know, kind of go forward. And if it was something about, you know, if it was something in performance, um, you know, for me, it was, it was a chance to do, you know, to do playwriting, you know, like that's something I've been writing journalism all these years, but I learned more about asking some of the right questions from Joe Carson and from some of my fellow cast members and the people involved in Headwaters who were all asking good questions and pointed questions. I asked, it helped me a lot in my journalism career, you know, which I've maintained since then, right? Sort of asking those open-ended questions and letting people and finding the story within that, as opposed to having an expected, you know, sort of question and looking for an expected answer, you know? Um, but anyway, to, to your point, about finding a um, you know an interest, I think that I think that was one of the things that uh, projects like Headwaters uh, is designed to do. You know, I think by in some level, that's part of what Lisa Mount's um, interest was. That's part of what Tommy Deadweiler and Terry Edgar, you know, and myself, all the everybody who was part of it at some point, and including the volunteer actors, that became part of the goal. You know, you know, what can we? How can we make this grow? You know, and it's interesting. And to hear you say that is really cool. And then to hear, to see other people, you know, doing things who from here, you know, whether it was Headwaters involvement or if that helped foster that interest, it's just been kind of cool to see that, see that happen and grow, you know, whether people are teaching in high school or doing a podcast or, or performing or whatever. That's just kind of cool to see that, um, you know, that gift keep on giving, so to speak. Yeah, it's uh, Headwaters has a special place in all of our hearts, all of us that have been a part of it. And I'm glad to have met you, Jerry. You've been a friend for years ever since I met you. You know, even though uh, I might have been a child at the time, you know, at grown up, uh, I remember, you know, I hit my 20s and I was, uh, we had some uh, movie nights with some of the yes, older or yes, some of the did. guys from the last year. And that was fun. I'd like to share something with you that I know that you and me and maybe one other person knows. 
And that's the magic secret word of Epoch. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, that has been Jerry Grillo. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, can't wait to see the. Uh, oh, yeah. Somebody's got to figure out a way to let me see this from Kentucky. I think well, somebody will be recording it. You know, it in. I wouldn't be surprised if it's our old friend and fellow bear, grandfather bear, Roger, who might somehow arrange to have it uh, recorded. But if not Roger, somebody I think will be doing some recording. I can't imagine that, that they won't want to capture this for posterity and, um, and to share with, with everyone who wants to see it. And for everyone who wants to mock it, you know, because let's face it, if we can't mock ourselves, did, by any, any chance, Stephen, I don't know if you remember bedwetters, I and mean, you might've been too young for bedwetters. But oh, bedwetters, I didn't know if we were allowed to talk about that. I don't know that we can talk about it or if you're allowed to on, on your podcast. But but Headwaters was so um, influential in this area, you know, that you're from of northeast Georgia, that um, we did a late night off center spoof of it called Bedwetters. And it was Headwaters, but for an adult audience jokes I won't share here, you, you know, for, for a family audience. And I think it's okay to say the title of the show, but other than that, we don't need to share much other than to say it was very adult oriented and it involved the bears doing things that bears wouldn't ordinarily do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Eating honey, right? Yeah. That, that's uh, it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. All right, man. I'll Thank talk to you a little bit. I'll see you around. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, my friend. And now bringing in our next guest, Amber Dean. Hi. What's up? Not much. It's good to see your face. You too. It has been a long time since, what was it? Headwaters 2013? Like a decade. 2012 i don't even remember it's somewhere around there somewhere yeah around there one of the the last year of headwaters as we knew it and and now it's back as something brand new so i being up in a uh beautiful portion of eastern kentucky have very little idea of what's going on with the show this year. Is there anything now keep in mind, you know, this is for promotional stuff. Don't give away too many spoilers, but uh, what can you tell us about the upcoming show? Do you know anything about it? So we just got our first um, version of the script, which I'm sure will change a lot last night. And it looks like what we're going to do is um, a lot of songs, a lot of songs from all the different years. I think the show went on for seven summers. Mm -hmm. So we've got songs from every uh, iteration of the show. And then we have a few monologues. Uh, we're not really doing group scenes that much, but we have some um, monologues coming back. One that's very exciting to me is the Woods Cult monologue that was from far before I started the show when I was just a audience member. And then I will be um, reprising my role as Katie, the young uh, hard of hearing girl who learns Japanese. And I think we have a scene about the, um, the, the Gay Straight Alliance that started in Wild County High School. So little little controversy but we have never been afraid of that before so it's gonna be really cool yeah controversy definitely isn't a thing that scares anybody in saw t oh, no. i love it i love the difference between the main bit of white county and then when you get over to saw t you can breathe a little bit be yourself just everyone seems more friendly over there to me it, at least it really is my favorite place and i've I've lived here my whole life and I'm glad I found it. Like I love headwaters so much because I was raised in a way to where if I let my parents just brainwash me, I would probably have hated everybody in headwaters, but it, it was saving grace that kept me to remember, you know, uh, 
you got to accept people as they are and uh you'll meet some wonderful people that way and we i think me and you are so we were pretty young when we like came into this so i feel like it happened at a very pivotal point i was i want to say i was eight the first time i was in headwaters oh god okay yeah i didn't join until i was like 20. yeah i was in the first couple of years oh that's so I cool been, i might have been older than eight i don't know i was a young and you know I was like, uh, I was just 13 the last year I did it before I uh, took off until doing it again the year that uh, I was with you. Yeah. And it's it's really crazy since we've been like trying to get people back together. All of the kids that were like 16 in my last year are grown adult people. So old. Like they're... They're they're in their twenties. They're the age I was when I started this stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, it's uh, and you know, I remember growing up. Uh, I didn't even really understand a lot of what was going on. Uh, the first year I was in it, you know, and uh, then a couple years later, I watched the one of the rare DVDs that exist, and I was like, oh, this is actually pretty brilliant. Yeah, I think, to see myself, but yeah, I had to watch um, the shows that I was in to try to help, like pick out songs and stuff. And I was like, I don't want to see what I looked like at twenty one. It was dark yeah. times. Dark times. But so, I've mentioned a little bit of why Headwaters was important to me. Why is Headwaters important to you? Um. I, I, I have a wonderful family who I love very much, but they are very conservative. Um, we grew up Southern Baptist. I am not Southern Baptist. I, uh, I grew up in a world that was very, um, very into binary gender roles. I, I am not into that. So I very much felt like an outsider for a lot of my life. And then I kind of found this community of people that made me not feel like an outsider, that made me feel like I was normal and I fit in and there was nothing inherently wrong with me. And that was very important to like kind of making me more open and more proud of who I am. That's that's one of the many beautiful things about Headwaters and the people that make up that is there's just like i already said they're so accepting there's so many people from different walks of life and you know i love the fact that i was part of that family even as probably the most reserved one of the group until uh a good head waiters night but uh, you know um other than that you know, they helped me see the world is a lot bigger than this one little sliver that I'd been shown my whole life. And I still like, I don't get to see a lot of the people because everyone has kind of, I've stayed here and everyone has kind of went their own way. But I think all the time about the things that like, especially the older people in the show, um, seeing like adults who were just living their lives and being who they were and that was okay and they were still successful i i think about them constantly you know what i don't understand and i think about constantly i think about the adults that were doing the headwaters practices every day and making rehearsals and somehow still living a life outside of that i don't know i can't comprehend that they had like jobs and kids and stuff. I know. That was impressive. Which I guess now I'm doing it with, with a job, not with kids, but now I'm handling it as an adult. Couldn't imagine, but I am glad that I get to do my little bit for Headwaters and have you guys on and just 
get to talk about it. So it's all I've talked about for months. So I'm happy someone actually wants to listen. A lot of people want to listen. And by the time that the show comes and those seats are filled, you'll see that. Heck, probably Lisa will be running around throwing papers around. We got to have a third day. We got to have a third day. I hope so. But any last things you want to say about Headwaters before we go? I'm really not used to running segments this short, but we've got a lot of people that want to be on this one, and I don't want it to be to where people are like, oh, my God, in this show already. Uh, no, thanks for letting me talk about it. I'm so excited. Um, I, I cried openly in public reading the script. I think it's going to be good. I think people are going to love it. And it's going to be a good time. You should try to make it down for a show or a rehearsal or just to hang out with us. Awesome. Well, uh, they definitely got to figure out some sort of streaming thing so I can check it out. But She's a genius. Mm hmm. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Amber, and uh, looking forward to the show. Like, just good luck. You can do it. You got this. And next on the show, Papa Bear himself, Roger Williams. Uh, how you doing, Steve? I'm doing pretty good. How about you, man? All right. Well, thanks for having me here today. Thanks for coming. Talking about the Headwaters reunion. It's going to be uh, very interesting for us. It's uh, hopefully it turned out better than the Friends reunion. <laughs> <laughs> that one, it, it kind of sucked, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, you know, so many years, but that's that's one thing about the difference between uh, headwaters reunion, we're kind of getting the friends reunion out of the way with this show, having everybody come on and catch up. And then uh, the headwaters reunion itself will be what everybody wants a good compilation of the songs and stories that people have come to know and love from the show. Uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. It's uh, kind of easy far as our part because uh we've rehearsed this thing for many years back uh what, 13 14 years ago so uh hopefully we haven't lost too many steps right you think it's something that'll just uh come back like riding a bike to a lot of people yeah i believe it will i believe that uh when, once we get into the, the old historic gymnasium and start going through the movements that it's going to start clicking. All you got to, I think the first move that Lisa should do as soon as everybody's involved or in the building is just <laughs> it's a quick little clap. It'll bring everybody else back. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. We can turn the world around. <laughs> it, uh, I well, actually, yeah, and, uh, you know, I was looking for that to use as the intro, and I thought I was going to have to get a hold of Lisa, but I finally found it deep in the dark recesses of YouTube, the original opening song. Oh, sweet. So, Headwaters Past, what, what brought you into the original first year of Headwaters? Well, I was uh, actually working at the community center at the time as a maintenance director. And uh, they kind of brought me into the fold. And one of my main objectives was to get air conditioning put into the gymnasium because <laughs> it was hot as Hades. And I really didn't want to be sweating in there night after night. And uh, so just before we opened, we we got the air conditioning put in. I got it put in and uh, got the gym ready. So uh, that made all the difference in the world because I don't think 
uh, you know, been, been over 100 degrees with all those people in there. Would, would not have been good for any of us. We've been dropping like flies. That first year was rough, man. But yeah. once that AC was in, the next years, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but just that building wasn't, you know, uh, when when do you think that building was built? It was built, I believe I remember it was like 1932. The uh, school had a really good basketball team, and the community was just so proud, and they would come out and watch them uh, compete with other schools. But sometimes the games will get called due to snow because they were playing outside. So the community got together, built the gymnasium, and it used to have a pot belly stove in there to help heat it, and... Uh, that's the way they came together. It's great that that uh, little building has had so much history in it throughout the years, even after uh, it has been done being used as a basketball facility. Yeah, we played uh, volleyball in there for years. We had uh, big, big volleyball tournaments, and there would be people sitting on the bleachers waiting to get into the game waiting for somebody else to drop out, get exhausted or whatever, and uh, so they could get in and play volleyball. That was uh, started by uh, Fred and Diane, if you know. Fred's famous peanuts up in Robertstown. Mm -hmm. Well, Fred and Diane started the volleyball tournaments, and uh, it really caught on big. Then we had Contra Dance, of course. That's been going on for years. I, I used to, you know, I've since moved uh, off to Kentucky, but I used to love going to the contra dancing on Saturday nights. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a pretty big deal, actually. It's a lot bigger. I've only been a couple of times. Uh, my dancing is about as good as my singing, but it, uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, a lot of people. I was actually talking about that the other day to uh, somebody I was I'd met up here. You know, they knew me as you know a metalhead and a podcaster, and they were like, uh, they asked if I knew how to dance. I was like, I can contra dance. They're like, what's that? I was like, a little bit like square dancing, a little bit like line dancing. They're like, you're lying to me. I'm like, nope. <laughs> contra dancing. It's the opposite of dancing, right? Contra. <laughs> but uh so tell me a little bit more about what do you know about headwaters coming up this year well uh we have a list of some of the songs that uh, we've performed in the past and uh i think it's, it's going to be a little more of an abbreviated uh compilation if you will it's uh and the poster here, you can't see the whole one behind me because uh, StreamYard wouldn't accept my uh, downsized version. But I got it right here. Oh, you got it? Oh, oh excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Yeah, it's, uh, of course, Saturday at, what, 730? And then Sunday at 4. It's kind of a matinee, I guess. But it promises to be a lot of fun. We have people, I know of at least three people flying in from the other side of the country to see this. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going to bring back a lot of memories. And it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great to see these people that we haven't seen, ones that are still with us. I know some have passed away, but. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Yeah. I've been talking to people, you know, uh, for this podcast about it and just bringing back some memories and, you know, it was a big part of my childhood through teenage years and, uh, growing up and I'm just, uh, I'm glad to see that, you know, there's still love for headwaters out there. <laughs> yeah. After all these years, I, I guess you have a few memories there, but, 
Remember when uh, John Boyce got hit? Oh my! Oh <laughs> my gosh! What was what did his shirt say? He had a shirt printed. About oh him. yeah! <clears throat> oh, I survived headwaters or something like that. Like a goodly portion of blood from my head, yeah, or something yeah. like that. But John <laughs> Lundin and I, you know, we're we're in the fire department, medical first responders, and uh, soon after that happened. Yeah, we went went backstage and we treated him, and uh, I think they went and took him uh, get get checked out at the hospital, make sure he was okay. What had happened was is we had a what there was a scene with some bears and uh, not real bears. It was you, of course. It was one of them, and there was a cage front that was made out of pvc that we would suspend and drop down uh from the ceiling and it broke one night and fell and hit one of the guys my age at the time in the head and so uh that was a whole fiasco there but he took it like a champ man he did he did he didn't scream he wasn't crying he was just like oh crap i'm bleeding (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was one of the more exciting times (laughs) but the whole thing you know it there was never a dull moment and i'm i'm really glad that i was a part of it glad that i got to meet you and uh glad that i got to talk to you for a little bit even though it's short uh today about the show yeah uh, like i said we're looking forward to it and uh, there, there's a lot of memories that uh, started popping up in my head uh, when they announced that we were going to do this again. And uh, some good, some bizarre. <laughs> it's uh, I don't I don't know if you remember. I also played uh, not just a bear, but uh, a couple other bit bit parts. And I believe it was when uh, you guys were kayaking or canoeing down the river or something, and I had to get up on the main stage and recite some words about these people, and I, and I needed to name them, and I'd always named them. And uh, I got up there that night, and it said, and I could not remember the names. There was like three names that I needed to say. And I could not remember the names for the life of me. And so I, being the professional that I was, I, uh, I did some stall tactics. I was like, oh, what was their names? You know, I was trying to buy myself a little bit of time. Well, after about 30 minutes, what well, seemed like 30 minutes, probably 30 seconds, <laughs> I, it's like, oh yeah, it, it uh, and I, Listed out the names and all that. Well, after the scene was over, I went in the backstage and I was like, oh, man. Luckily, this is live theater. Nobody's going to remember this after the show. and or Maybe not even notice. Maybe I covered it up. Uh, because, you know, I have had theatrical experience. I was Grasshopper Green in third grade. So, you know, I had a little bit of experience on stage. <laughs> but... Uh, I was backstage and I thought, nobody's going to remember this. And then later it dawned on me that Georgia Public Broadcasting was recording that night. (laughs) (laughs) What luck. What luck. The one night. The one one night they were recording. And of course, you know, you were thinking nobody's going to remember it. And that memory stuck with you for all this time. Absolutely. <laughs> but man, the backstage itself was, it was its own little thing. Like, I don't know, man, I had some good times back there, but just, uh, we could all just be ourselves back there, you know? Yeah. Just yeah, one big and, uh, family. Little microcosm back there. It, uh, everybody was usually typically in a very good mood. And just wanting to get the production done. Yeah, I've I've dealt with many 
productions in my life. And that was probably the most like for, for people, for how many people we had that didn't have any background in theater. Like it was the most gung ho, let's get it done group I've ever seen. Uh, luckily, with uh, Lisa and her merry band, that uh, they really, you know, kept things tightly woven and made it made it easier for us that we're not used to being on stage. Right. Well, Roger, I'm glad to have you on the show. I can't wait to see somebody somewhere is going to hook me up to where I can watch this all the way from Kentucky. I know it. <laughs> So I can't wait to see what it looks like. And uh, just thanks for coming on, man. And good luck. All right. And I also know that they're going to have uh, kind of a memorabilia wall with photos and uh, some of some of the costumes and whatnot uh, at, there at the gymnasium. Of course, they're limited to 100 people per night. So it's going to be uh, catch as catch can as far as getting tickets. Right. And they uh speaking of that memorabilia wall, they gotta they gotta hit up John Boys and get that shirt if he knows where that <laughs> is. That would be great. We'll have to mention that to Lisa if she can come up with it. I think she has bear suits. Yeah, those and those were one last thing, those were uh made out of firefighter suits, weren't they? <laughs> yes, it's uh you know, I was the captain of the fire station there in South Inacuchi at the time, and we had some old uh, turnout gear that we had retired. So my wife, Kathy Williams, and Terry Edgar, Tommy Deadweiler's wife, went through, cut little strips of black cloth, and then hot glued them onto it. And that way, John and I, being used to putting on turnout gear, being in the fire department and all, uh, could just jump right in and get get right on, put our gourd heads on <laughs> that the uh, gourd craft originals made for us, the bear heads. And you uh, the minute man of the show, just yeah. jumping, in, running in your bear gear last minute. Like, and sometimes somebody would ha be on call or be called out, and the bears would have to switch out last minute. Yeah, yeah, we've uh. But we've had, I don't know, two couple, I think, mostly during rehearsals, we had uh, some important fire calls that we just had to bail on everybody. Uh, but luckily, in rehearsals, it wasn't that bad. Um, we didn't one have too night, much going on during the show. There was one night, I believe it was the... Um, it was like our pre-show, like our uh, dress rehearsal. Yeah. That we had some people in that a call happened and I finally had it my time to shine as a bear. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that's that was uh, a fire, I believe. Either the fire or a car wreck, one or the other. I'd forgotten about that one. Yeah, I was, you know, as a kid I wanted to be a bear so bad, man. That <laughs> was for headwaters. I'm sure you made a hell of a bear. I didn't get to see it, but you did. But uh, thanks, Roger. It's been great, and uh, can't wait to see how this show turns out. All right, Stephen. Thanks for having me on board. All right, and here we have Lisa Mount. Hey, y'all. <laughs> how you doing? It has been uh, a long time, and... I've gotten to talk to many familiar faces uh, throughout this podcast, but yours, no offense, Jerry, is the one I was most excited to talk to. Ain't you sweet. I'll keep you 7-Eleven years. <laughs> uh, so well, it is, uh, Go ahead. when did you say that the show started again? We... Just, we uh, Start, the first performance was in 2007. The idea began to bubble up in 2002, 2003. And in 2005, uh, we began the whole process by bringing the amazing John O'Neill, 
uh, co-founder of the Free Southern Theater, the theatrical arm of the Civil Rights Movement, here to Sati Nakuchi to do some teaching about story circles and story collecting. And then we brought Joe Carson, who became our, who was our playwright, in in 2006. And she took some of the stories and did sort of a little excerpt performance. And by 2007, we were on a roll and put 47 people on stage and a, a snorchestra of 12 people and all the technicians and all the rest of it uh, into an unair conditioned gymnasium and made it, made it, made it a thing, made it a thing. And it lasted until 2013. Uh, many folks asked us why did Headwaters end since when you start a good thing, you kind of want it to go on forever. Well, Joe Carson died in 2011. And it's really hard to get new plays out of a dead playwright. Jerry Stropnicki and Jerry Grillo did extraordinary work, both excerpting some existing writings of Joe's and writing new material. And Jerry Grillo came in at the very beginning as Joe's co-playwright, because Joe came down with pneumonia uh, as we were rolling into the first production and needed help, which just opened so many doors. And turns out, oh yeah, Jerry Grillo is a hell of a good playwright. So uh, we, had a, we had lovely collaborations going on for all seven years of, of the show. Yeah, 2007 to 2013. And that, you know, for a lot of people, that was a good bit of their lives every summer. But for people like me, I was just thinking about it earlier today uh, before we started this. You know, I was 12 when it started. Mm -hmm. Headwaters had been a thing for most of my life. Yeah. No, I hadn't been a part of it every single year. It was definitely my first, it was my first family away from family, which is very important. Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was clear, Stephen, that you were a natural performer. Um, and you took to it. Yeah. I was just watching the opening from the show and, it, it, for the first two shows, the way that people introduced themselves was by saying where they came from without saying the name of a place. And your line, sir, was, I come from shut up and sit down. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, Very it was a complete joy to tell stories of this place. It took us um, to some really interesting places. We told some hard stories. We told some really beautiful stories. We sang some gorgeous songs because, of course, singing happens here impromptu. Um, Courtney Johnston and I were at a party on uh, Saturday night, Friday night, and just looked at each other and immediately launched into song because that's kind of what happens. So in many ways, we were tapping into the natural energy of this place. And it's... I don't know. It just uh, headwaters is just such an important thing to the area. Um, you know, it from the very beginning, like there's stories that needed to be told and needed to live on. And there was a way to do that. And you guys came up with that and brought the community together in a way that really hadn't happened in a long time. Yeah, there's, there's a long history of community theater in this place, uh, but there had not been a history of doing, sorry, I'm just shifting here. There had not been a history of doing theater that was about this place. We've been doing a lot of existing plays, some Shakespeare, uh, you know, there were a lot of actors who would come and spend their summers here, and we would make all sorts of performances, but they were somebody else's plays. And what was so important about Headwaters was that it was ours. Um, one of the songs that I, uh, that actually, I don't feel like I wrote that song. I feel like that song just showed up and I captured it, um, it was Ain't No Place, right? Ain't No Place, anything like this place, anywhere around this place, so this must be the place. Um, and we, yeah, we really tried to live in that spirit and to make something with, by, for, and about our goodly portion of beautiful Northeast Georgia. Um, a naming that we uh, took with permission from Gloria Brown, who made a map of a goodly portion of beautiful Northeast Georgia. It was a very particular map that named places as she saw them uh, and as she lived them. 
And that's, you know, that's kind of what this stage show was, two hours worth of folks telling real stories and real people. That's, a, that's another thing that was, that, you know, I loved so much. Some of our performers, one of our performers had been on Broadway in the original Broadway cast of 42nd Street. Some of our performers hadn't been on stage since second grade. Some of our performers had never been on stage. And as you may remember, we didn't have auditions. We had a talent inventory. What can you do? So anybody who was willing to make the commitment could be in the show. Now, if, if you had some talent and some skill, then you were in the show in a larger way. Uh, and had more to do, but everybody had something to do, and there was truly a place for everybody. So. And it helped people discover talents too, you know, so. find themselves in ways. You know, uh, I had talked to some people before about the show, and they didn't really have a sense of belonging until they came into Headwaters. And I had mentioned to somebody else earlier, I probably. You know, it's a domino effect of things, but I probably wouldn't be doing the podcast right now had it not been for Headwaters making me realize that I have a heart for entertainment. True that. True that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Sautina Cucci Center slogan is, we change lives, which I can get all snarky about because lots of things change people's lives and not necessarily for the better. But we can count marriages, we can count deeply supportive friendships, we can count people who discovered themselves, we can count people who told their own stories on stage in really powerful and transformative ways. It actually did change some lives. It certainly changed mine. Uh, made me a much better human, much better director, much better producer, and much better resident of this place. My, my joke was, that I was an artist in residence in my own hometown. Um, and it enabled me to make relationships that are still profoundly important to me. Um, and friendships that, you know, you just, you learn something by doing something with people that you don't learn by just, you know, sitting at the bar, shooting stuff, whatever. Uh, it, particularly that first year, because our rehearsal process was so long. We didn't know what we were doing, so we figured if we had a lot of time, we might figure it out. So we spent, what, like 10 weeks in rehearsal? Maybe it was 10 weeks for the whole thing, but it was long. Um, yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, we, we started in May and the show went on in July. It was long, but that's because we had to build it from scratch. We'd never done anything like this before. I'd never done anything like this before. I'd, I'd, produced and directed scripted works and existing works and new plays, but new plays that were written by an artist who had a brilliant idea and it came out of their head and they set it down on paper. To create a play with two playwrights working together across disability um, at the time, which only got worse as the process, process went along, uh, to, you know, for Jerry Grillo to, to work on his own family story, um, his story, his wife's story, and his son's story, all of that, yeah, it made us, be it made us better humans and it made us better artists. Um, Joe Carson, whom I speak of a lot and for whom I am the executrix of her literary estate, um, Joe at that point had written more than 25 community story plays across the country. She was during that last period of her life, the most commissioned playwright in America. And she got her oeuvre all the way up to Shakespeare numbers. Uh, but this one was different, right? Because Joe would say, you know, some of these plays are a, a community that needs to reconcile itself to itself. Others of these were seen as economic development endeavors. Um, <laughs> and there's a joke that we're putting into the reunion concert about it. The community's got to be pretty desperate if they think a play will solve their problems. Um, this one was a bit of a restoration of soul project where we really, we needed to get back in touch with the land, the shape of the land, the original stewards of the land. We always credited the Cherokee people. Um, and stories of desegregation, which was done incredibly badly here in Northeast Georgia. Um, stories of the Gay-Straight Alliance at White County High School, 
which was sort of a third rail story when we started the project. I knew I wanted to tell it, but it was still such a hot topic. We had to wait until 2012, 2013, when it had cooled a little bit to tell it. Stories of a guy that we named Jimbo in the show, uh, who we thought at the time was dead, but we have since discovered he's not. He's still alive. So it's a good thing we didn't call him by his name. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, um, there's, there's, there's such, such clarity and inspiration to be gained gained and gamed, I suppose, from doing hard work together. Um, and it was hard work, but by God, it was fun. So what can you tell us about this year's upcoming reunion show to get people excited, fill out the seats? I'm surprised if it's not already sold out if you... Yeah, we're, we're recording this uh, on the Sunday before we start. It's real close to sold out at this point, but we have secret ways to add extra seats. Um, so as an emergence in the late pandemic, uh, when everyone in our cast is vaccinated, we realized that the best way to come back together to make a live performance was to do something that was born out of true love for this place and for one another, and to just dive back into that spirit. So we've put together a relatively short show, two short acts, about 45 minutes each. And we'll do, I think, 10 of the songs that were key to the original plays. Um, we, we made three full scripts of plays, and so we're taking little excerpts from each of those. And we're telling summaries in really poetic fashion. Jerry Stropnicki and Jerry Grillo crafted some really beautiful just ways to summarize the stories that we told as lead-ins to the songs that we sang. And as a super special bonus, we are doing three of Joe Carson's monologues that she wrote for the original uh, Headwaters uh, stories from a goodly portion of beautiful Northeast Georgia script. So we're doing a story about a young woman who had a child out of wedlock, who, or no, who was a child who had been had out of wedlock, uh, known locally as a woods cult, um, who became a teacher and of great service to this community but never forgot where she came from. Uh, Rebecca Steele and Lauren Turner are gonna perform that. And then we're doing um, a story called Honor and Dignity. that was about the integration of the schools here when they asked the principal of the Consolidated Black High School. And right? if you think about Northeast Georgia as a collection of counties, the four counties in this area sent all the black children to one high school. Um, and black kids had to ride a school bus past the white kids who were going to a whole different school. They had the only principal who had a PhD, Dr. Rosser. And when Northeast Georgia and Habersham County and White County and uh, I think it was Stevens County and I forget the fourth, I'm going to say Rabin, but I'm not sure that I'm right. When they finally, finally decided to comply with Brown versus Board of Education, 10 years after that decision came down, they told Dr. Rosser, here's your choice. We're gonna close down this school. Either you fire all your teachers and we'll find a place for you as a teacher in the system, or we will fire all your teachers and you'll be fired too. Dreadful choice. And how a man maintains his honor and his dignity in the midst of that, it was a beautiful and compelling story to tell. And then the last story that we're going to tell comes from Gloria Brown, who gave us the name of the first show and who was a beloved designer, community member, baker, you name it. Gloria did all sorts of stuff. She was sort of the glue that held a lot of things together. Uh, Gloria had a great story about a plastic foot that she would stick in unusual places, including out of the hood of her car, and the sheriff was not amused. So we got... Yeah. That <laughs> and we're trying to find the original foot. It's there somewhere. Although we might have sent it back to Gloria's daughter up in Massachusetts. We'll see. We'll see. Vermont. Excuse me. Vermont. It would be sort of like saying, oh, yeah, Stephen, there you are in Georgia. No, you are not. You are in Kentucky. And they are hey. not the same place. And heck, I almost, talking about this show has made me almost want to 
get some people together and write a Kentucky version of it. Indeed. Indeed. But only because the stories you hear around here, not like the stories you hear in Georgia. How so? There, there is a lot of the uh, supernatural and sci-fi around here, such as aliens wow. holding up a farm and Mothman and all sorts of stuff like that. That's where I'm at. There you go. You might be a natural attractor for those kinds of stories, you know. I might. But who knows? Who knows? I feel, I feel like exciting stuff just happens to me whether I want a day off or not. So <laughs> There you go. Well, just to give a plug, there is a thing called the Hurricane Gap Institute over in Harlem, Kentucky, where they teach folks how to do story plays and uh, have been producing a play uh, under the name of Higher Ground. Joe Carson wrote the first of those uh, for, I'm going to say, maybe 20 years. Yeah, great folks, really great folks. Yeah, definitely uh, send me that because I'll forget as soon as we're done with this. <laughs> But, uh, You're gonna edit sound, man, so you'll hear it again once at least. <laughs> but so, anything else that you'd like to say to the fans of Headwaters, to the people that have never heard it before, or just uh, I don't know any concerns, comments, cries of anguish, anything of the sort. Uh, you know, I'm I'm feeling too good to have the cries of anguish. We called it Headwaters because Northeast Georgia is the headwaters to a dozen rivers. So the, the rivers really do wash the mountains here, and it's an extraordinary place. Um, our in, informal and inappropriate slogan is Sauti Nikuchi, you wouldn't like it. So y'all come visit and then go home. And what are the dates for this again, one last time before we end this? Indeed, we're doing the show on July 17th at 7.30 p.m. and on July 18th, at 4 p.m. Tickets and information can be found at smca.org. That's the Sauti Nakuchi Community Association. Thank you. And this has been the Confound Millennial featuring a goodly portion of people from Headwaters. <laughs>